Well, this is quite some time since I've had this guest with me. You can't see him. You can only see his name, Saint Murad. But many of you know him. He has his own channel. He has been on Fander Films quite a few times before. He's one of our good friends. He's part of our Sin Sifter group. And uh, he has done some amazing work. Uh, We did a uh, work on the Dome of the Rock. We looked also at the word Muhammad in the Quran in the past, and those videos were viral, going over 100,000 views. He has been very popular, not only on this channel, but also with Mel from Sneakers Corner. Works with Mel quite hand and foot. Uh, Murad cannot show his face, and you won't see his face for a very good reason. He lives in a country that is... Uh, very insecure when it comes to criticizing Islam. And for that reason, we don't even know who he is. You'll never see his face. You'll only hear his voice. He is right now with me, right over here to my right, but he's thousands of miles away. That's the beauty of Zoom webinar. But Murad has been looking at the Quran, and uh, he uh, understands Arabic fluently. Uh, So he has been looking at translating the Quran into classical Arabic, and what he has found is that many of our translators, most of those who are translating the Quran from Arabic into English, not only do they not understand the Aramaic, which is the original Quran he has come out of, they don't even understand the Arabic. And he has found that there has been a concerted effort, possibly uh, intentionally, as he'll probably tell us, uh, on why certain words have been translated the way they have. Now, what he's going to do in this episode is to look at the word abrogation. In chapter 2, verse 106, and in chapter 16, verse 101, the two classical verses on abrogation means changing um, uh, from mansuk to nasik. We've always thought, I've always thought, I've always been told that the Quran refers to this abrogation. It's referring to previous scripture and that which comes later, or previous verses, and verses which come later. And the lat which comes later abrogates that which comes before. That's the way I've always thought. Murad's going to show us that that's not quite the case. And this is going to be interesting. This will be the first time I've heard this. It'll be the first time you've heard this. So I'm going to say, good to have you here, Murad. Do you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, Dr. Smith. Uh, It's a great honor to be with you once again, and I'm happy to talk with the people uh, once again. Good. Okay. Well, this is going to be fun. I'm just going to hand it over to you. I've got my pen and paper, and I'm going to be going and taking notes like others are taking notes. And then I'm at the very end, I'm going to do a wrap up, try to summarize uh, what I've learned from what you're telling us. And I'm I'm waiting with uh, bated breath because I know this is going to be new. It's going to be controversial as most of the stuff you do is. And at the same time, it's going to help us understand what and where do we go to to find what the Arabic Quran really says. Over to you. Yes, before I share screen, I will just uh, tell the people that as I'm translating the Quran, I remember that Odin Lafontaine, he came on here and he did a great job, uh, like, for example, looking at the word Nasara and the word Quran. And he takes the word and he looks at every single time they are they are mentioned to see what is the most logical explanation for the word. Well, what I am doing is I'm actually creating a whole dictionary using the same criteria and the same method. Because if the word is perfectly fine here, but it makes no sense at all at a different verse, then we are walking on the wrong path. Mm -hmm. So as I'm going on, I discovered, and of course, also as an Arab speaker, I discovered that these words, they do not mean what we are conditioned to believe. Mm -hmm. So now I will share screen and uh, we will look at the whole abrogation issue. Okay. Surah 2 verse 106 is the basis for the whole abrogation doctrine. Muslims point to other flimsy verses to try and establish abrogation. 
Today we will focus on Surah 2 verse 106, but after we look at certain verses in the beginning. Before going straight to it, we have to decode the meaning of two Arabic words first, and that is ayah and nasakha. The word ayah, let's look into it. This is in Arabic. Sal Bani Israel kam ataynahum min ayah. Abdullah Yusuf Ali translate, ask the children of Israel how many clear signs we have sent them. And in Sahih International, ask children of Israel how many a sign of evidence. So these two translations, they agree that a is sign. Now let's look at Surah 3 verse 15. Abdullah Yusuf Ali says, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. Sahih International. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. And it's the same word here, ayah, very clear. Surah 5, verse 114. وَآخِرْنَا لَأَوِلْنَا وَآخِرْنَا وَآيَةً Abdullah Yusuf Ali, ayah is sign. Sahih International, ayah is sign. If we put it all together, when we put it all together, you will find that ayah always means sign. Now let's switch gears and look at the word asakh. In Surah 7, verse 154, it says, وَلَمَّا سَكَتَ عَنْ مُوسَى الْغَضَبْ أَخَذَ الْأَلْوَاحِ وَفِي نُسْخَتِهَا Al-Alwaah, which is, of course, the commandments when Moses took it. Abdullah Yusuf Ali says, and in the writing there on was guidance. Sahih International says, in their inscription was a guidance. Let's look at the same word. نُسْخَتِهَا here نَسْتَنْسِخْ Abdullah Yusuf Ali says, for we were wont to put on record all that you did. Sahih International says, transcribe. At the very same word, nastansikh and nasikh. Another surah here, and this is the one which created the problem. Here, Satan threw some vanity into his desire, but God will cancel anything vain that Satan throws in, and God will confirm and establish his signs. Here ayah is clear that it's signs, but here yansakh. Abdullah Yusuf Ali doesn't put it like he did before, as put it on record or write it. He now says cancel for the very same word. Why? Because he sees a problem. How can God transcribe or inscribe what the Satan throws into a man? So he uses his logic to go around it. Sahih International does the same thing. Here it says, but Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in, then Allah makes precise his verses. Here, Sahih International says verses, while Abdullah Yusuf Ali here still has logic and he uses sign, which is the only meaning for ayah. More clues. The word nasakha in today's Arabic is regarded as copy. If you ask any Arab speaker, tell me, uh, tell him, I want nusakh, he will give you copies. He will not say, no, it means abrogation. In today's Arabic keyboard that we use, the word copy and paste, the commands are nasakha wa lasakha. They are not abrogate. Nasakha means copy. Today, today. In college, if you want a copy of the material, you say, please give me some nusakh, give me some copies. The Quran translators themselves know that the word doesn't mean abrogate. The word abrogate in Arabic is fasakh with a fa, fasakh. It's not in the Quran. Even Google Translate knows when I put the word nansakh, it says copy, because this is how we use it today. If I put abrogate in Google Translate, it would give me fasakh. People will say, well, what about the other? Uh, things down, well, it's فَسَخَ أَبْطَلَ أَلْغَ 
never nasakh, never ever. A disclaimer is that I never use Google Translate to establish truth. I just do it to show how ironic it is. <laughs> so if we put these verses together, you will find فَيَنْسَخُ نَسْتَنْسِخُ فِي نُسْخَتِهَا It will be he inscribed. We used to ask for inscribing and it's transcription. And it's very clear from uh, the one about Moses. Because when it says here, أَخَذَ الْأَلْوَاحِ He took the commandments and in its not copy because it's only one copy and in its inscription is Huda and Rahma. So when the Muslims they say Al Tawra Mansukha, they without understanding they are saying it's inscribed, meaning inscribed maybe even by the hand of God. It doesn't mean it's abrogated. This is against the language. I'm speaking language only, I'm not speaking theology. Okay, now let's look at the correct translation after we now know the, the real meaning of the two words. We now know what does ayah mean, what does nasakha mean correctly. So this is the controversial verse. It says, We do not inscribe of a sign unless we, or cause it to be forgotten, unless we bring forth one that is similar or better. So this would be the translation, how I would translate it. We do not inscribe of a sign or cause it to be forgotten, lest we bring forth one that is better or similar to it. Don't you know that Allah is capable over everything? So what's the difference? <clears throat> is that here we are not talking about a verse in the Quran, in the book called the Quran. We are talking about if a servant asks God, Lord, give me a sign. So God will respond by a sign that is similar to the ones before or better, but nothing less. So it's talking about a sign, a wonder, a miracle. It doesn't talk about verses in the Quran advocating each other or uh, a theology that is uh, contradicting each other. Now, let's see how dishonest translators translate it. So here we have the same verse and the same words that we have looked at before. Abdullah Yusuf Ali here switches and says, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten. So here, <clears throat> although he knows the meaning of these two words because he translated them differently in other places, now he says, uh, revelations and abrogate. Sahih International, we do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except to bring forth one. So they all agree. Why? Because they have this abrogation theology in their head. So why the mistranslation? The translators are under the spell of later hadith and later exegesis, which mention the doctrine of abrogation. Would they step out of later Islamic tradition and honestly translate word for word? Of course not. Why come up with this doctrine? In regards to the word Nasakha that we have seen, Muslims from the beginning sensed that Allah inscribes what the devil casts in him is a problem. And this is a problem that uh, has to do with the satanic verses later. But for now, we are seeing that this is what God said in the Quran. It's problematic. So they automatically said that this is abrogate and not inscribe, because of course, God would never inscribe what Satan throws in a man. But this is what the Quran is saying. I have nothing to do with it. They don't know, however, that the God of the Quran consistently declares to be the source of good deeds and bad deeds, unlike the God of the Bible. Because in the Bible, the theology is Anything good would be from God, anything bad would be from you. But the Quran, no. He could lead you astray, God, if he likes. He could inscribe what the devil says if he likes. He could abrogate if he likes. So this is the theology of the Quran, and it is consistent, no problem. As for the word ayah, Muslim deliberately misinterpret and distort it to mean verse. Why is that? Because the Quran has some contradictions 
And the doctrine of abrogation is the only way to save it. So they will have to make it this way. Another hidden reason as to why abrogation is handy is because how they divide it. They divide it into three categories, and this is the Muslim exegesis. They say there is something called a written verse is abrogated, but its legislation is still active. This would be like the verse of stoning. Today we ask, why do people like uh, ISIS and Taliban, they stone people when it's not in the Quran? They say no, because it's abrogated, but it doesn't have written verse. So when Umar ibn al-Khattab, the caliph, said <coughs> that this verse abrogated, then you have to believe him. This is why abrogation doctrine opens the door for all these problems. The second category would be that legislation is abrogated, but its written verse is still there in the Quran. An example would be the peaceful verses in the Quran. Muslims will tell you, well, uh, uh, the verse of the sword abrogated peaceful verses. This is the second type. The third type, and this would be the one that the caliphs really like, is that the written verse and the legislation are both abrogated. This could make a hadith abrogate the verse. Actually, here anything goes. And this is the, the idea. So the conclusion. Muslim translators neither respect the Quranic text nor the Western audience. Muslim translators give themselves the right to translate the very same word in very different ways. When Muslims comment that the Bible is corrupted, they are shooting themselves in the foot because the word mansuh means inscribed, not corrupted, or abrogated. They should use mafsuh if they like, or mulha. They should, even if they want to attack, they should know exactly the words they are using. I used to think that most Muslims don't know Aramaic. Now I know that they don't know Aramaic or Arabic. And actually, the Da'wah team, when I look at them, how they speak Arabic, it's very broken and very weak. And it's just that they know Arabic more than the Western people. They say, you don't know Arabic. But I, as an, as an Arab speaker, this is my mother tongue, I tell them, you don't know Arab. And they surely don't. English translators have always abused the Quran. This is a, a bad fact, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. They don't feel any guilt stuffing extra words in the translation as if <clears throat> it is there in the Arabic. Actually, if you just look at any verse in the Arabic <clears throat> and beside it the verse in English, you will find that the English is twice its size. This, just by looking with your eyes, is wrong. They also paraphrase each sentence under the guise of it won't be accurate in English, thereby omitting whole words and phrases. They also feel free to translate a lot of different words into one English word. For example, the word ahl and al and nas and qawm are very different. In English, they just say people. When, if they have respect, they should say qawm is folk, nas is people, El is family, Ahl is kin, everything is very different. And the word Ahl, Ahl, for example, is used always with Pharaoh, meaning family of Pharaoh. And this uh, would change the meaning. It means that the Quran is very personal with Moses and the family of Pharaoh, not the people of Pharaoh. Very important all this stuff, but they just ignore it and they do not respect the Western audience. <coughs> they do so because they can't imagine that someone will call them out. Now, in the Murat translation that I will do, English Quran translation, translators, they don't fear any judgment. That is why they abuse the Quran as long as they are lying for the Quran, then no problem. The Western world have yet to witness an over and above 90% uh, accurate Quran. That is why I am working on translating the Quran by creating a dictionary of all its words first. 
That is how I will do it. Then I will translate after I have my own dictionary. Accurately looking at each individual word in all verses to precisely pinpoint the intended meaning. All I ask the people is to support me by uh, subscribing to my YouTube channel now. And I'm not uploading a lot of videos because I am working in this huge endeavor, translating the Quran. Two translations. One would be assuming it's 100% Arabic, and the other would be by adding the whole Aramaic uh, layer. And uh, this will be two Qurans in the future. I wish to finish them in the future. And that's all I have to say, Dr. Smith, if you like to comment. Listen, um, Murad, this has been good. Thank you so much. This is an area that most of us would not have even come across. We would not even understand. In fact, this is the first time really hearing what you're saying. I'm. It's not that I'm not. Uh, I've not heard it before. We do know that we do know that an awful lot of of the English translations are what we call apologetical translations, and we we kind of joke about this that they take out any difficult words or any difficult theologies or any difficult ideas. And they manipulate the text. And this is exactly what you're saying. They do manipulate the text. There are many, in the Arabic, there are many ways to say the same thing. They'll use the same word, like the example you gave of people. Uh, and instead of going to kin or family or uh, those who are companions, they just say people. And that's, a, it, again, it, it, it's takes away the meaning, the original text, but also it can also manipulate that the narrative that they want to give. In this case, you've given a good example, just looking at chapter 2, verse 106, where the word they have put into for Nasaka and Aya is abrogate. They really, the real world, the real meaning of these words is sign. And the other one is uh, well, the inscription or inscribe. inscribe. Yes. Sign and inscribe. And it's fascinating that the word abrogate is fasaka, which is not even in the Quran. So the word that they have introduced into English doesn't even, can't be found in the Arabic in the Quran. But there is an agenda there. There is a narrative. Now, let me ask you this. Before we go on and before we just end this all off, because you're going to do another uh, example of this with the sex slaves and and uh, and references that you see there in the Quran. Before we move on, the agenda in this case, the narrative that they're trying to get across. If you could just explain, what's the purpose and what do they? Why do they need to have the word abrogation? Why do they even need this concept of abrogation? Because in my mind, that makes it even more difficult. If this is an eternal word of God, how then can that humans or time periods that it gets abrogated because abrogation by definition suggests there is something previous that no longer is. You see, during the Abbasid period, they wanted different legislations. And there are legislation, legislations that come from the Sunnah that are not in the Quran. So the only way to get around this is to say that uh, the Quran is actually evolving itself. It is evolving. So it is you can use a legislation from the Sunnah, and uh, a lot of Salafis, they do this today, and uh, normal Muslims, the, like the Muslim that you will see on the street, he will say, how come you use a Sunnah to abrogate something in the Quran? Mm. But this is because they have this doctrine. This is the first thing. And the other thing is that they have to do it this way because there is a verse saying that Allah inscribes what the devil throws in you. And this is actually a reason as to why they had to come up with the satanic verses, because it means that God tested Muhammad this way, then he made him victorious over it. So this is the idea. Okay, so in some ways, what you're, I mean, I mean, that's a great way of putting it. What you're saying is the Sunnah has different criteria, has different rulings than what's in the Quran. And you cannot confront the Quran because the Quran is sacrosanct. It is holy. It is above criticism. It is eternal. So what you do say is, ah, but within the Quran, it already supports a, a difference, a changing. So in some ways, it's been, uh, you can see, Murad, what has happened here. In Christianity, we are very clear that 
when you look at the Old Testament, you see what God is doing with people as they evolve, they progress. And we call it progressive revelation. So when you look at the Old Testament, you see what God did in 1400 BC. This no longer is the case when Christ comes uh, 1400 years later. And that's called progressive revelation. So God, in Matthew 5, you have him say, uh, you hear Christ say, for you have heard it say in the Mosaic law, but I now say here is a new uh, law. Here is not one that abrogates it. It actually fulfills it. And he says that, for I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. That's called progressive revelation. In some ways, the Islam has done this. And so you're saying the Abbasids did this. They realized that they needed to put new ideas, new theologies, even new doctrines, but they couldn't confront the Quran. So they introduced this law of abrogation within the Quran to alleviate that problem. And then, of course, the second thing you brought up, and that is the whole problem with Satan. How could Satan have anything to do with God's holy law? So that's why abrogation need to be put in there to eradicate that problem. It's a clever way of getting around it, but to do that, they had to change the words. And that's where they confronted Ayah and Nasik, and you're bringing it back to the original Arabic. And I love the way you said that at the very, be- at the very end by concluding. You said, Murad, that not only are these translators do they not know Aramaic? They don't know Arabic as well. And uh, you point pointed the Dawa team, especially, is clumsy in this way. Listen, this is good. So this means that you are going to go back and bring back the original text. You're going back and you're going back to what the word had was always intended. And once you get back to that, then we can see an entirely new uh, context of what the Quran is really saying. It'll be great when you finally get your work done and when you finally can then give it to the world, your Murad translation of the Quran. Thanks so much, Murad, for coming on board. I know you're going to bring up another example of one of these hoaxes. So until then, this is Jay and Murad. He's thousands of miles away, though seems like right next door, at least his voice is. Until the next time, this is the two of us, over and out. (music) 